My name is uh, Bob Daigle. I live in Warren, Michigan, just north of Detroit. I've been uh, interested in big, Bigfoot things since about 1989, and I've been doing field investigations since about 1991. Uh, all my life I've been very interested in wildlife and reading books about bears and elk and uh, all sorts of you know, wildlife things. And I never, and back in 1989, I haven't recalled that I'd ever heard of Bigfoot. It wasn't on my mind at all. We took a trip with my family out to uh, Mount Rainier, Washington, and it was late May. We went up to the top of Mount, or near the top of Mount Rainier, probably about the 10,000 foot level, and it was the first day that the road up there had been cleared of snow. I mean, I couldn't believe that there would still be 10 foot, 10 feet deep snow banks, snow drifts up there in the <coughs> day. Anyways, the, big, the uh, visitor center was a very large sorry, modern building. They had a kind of an extensive bookstore. There were three booklets in there, like eight and a half by 11 size, and not quite this thick, by a man named John Green, who had been investigating Bigfoot, I think, since the 1960s, or probably early 1960s. So I started reading those uh, books as we, we had a pop-up camper. We were camping in the general area, and I'd say to my wife, gee, you know where we camped last night? They had a Bigfoot sighting pretty close to there 10 years ago from having read these books. So that got me uh, interested in the subject, and then for a couple of years I just tried to find everything I could in terms of books and things about Bigfoot. And I was driving from Detroit to Washington, D.C. on business, driving past Cleveland. And just by accident I heard a radio commercial saying there was going to be a, an RV camper show in Cleveland on my way back on a Friday night. And so I stopped in there, and the, this guy, John Green, who one of the earliest authors of Bigfoot books. He happened to be there, and he was showing this famous uh, Roger Patterson film. By the way, these are taken from that film, these big posters. So I talked to him, and then I met some guys there that were helping him out that were from southern Ohio. And this one guy said, yeah, we have monthly uh, meetings down in a little town called New Comerstown. It's about 80 miles south of the Ohio Turnpike, south of Cleveland. So I started going to those meetings, and then uh, I got invited by someone who lived in the area to come out to. He said it's his sister's and sister-in-law's house, and they'd been having Bigfoot incidents around their house for a few years, and they wanted someone to investigate. So I spent the summer of a lot, a lot of time during the summer of 1991 and 1992 in their area trying to uh, get videos of Bigfoot, and I did have a little success. I'll show you some of that later on. Um, <clears throat> so this is well. I'll explain a little bit what's up here. I got a little. What we're going to do in general, I was, we get the uh, slideshow thing working. I'll have a series of slides explaining different things about Bigfoot. And then I'll have a uh, little intermission. Then I have some videos to show. And then uh, I also have some my, sort of my collection of photos related to Bigfoot that I found on the internet over the years. And, uh, so these, uh, how many of you have seen that Roger Patterson film on TV? This is a still from it here and these are five of the frames that somebody worked with and kind of blew them up and so while they're up there I'm going to use my brand new little laser pointer some interesting things to note on some of these this foot here shows some amount of bend uh, one person was able to analyze one of the stills from that film and uh, there's a kind of a sharp even sharper bend in the foot which Humans don't have that kind of uh, foot flexibility. This guy, uh, Professor Jeff Meldrum from Idaho State University, is an expert in the uh, foot structure of primates, gorillas, apes, and um, he's got a big collection of alleged Bigfoot ca uh, casts where they find a track and make these kind of plaster casts. And he says from examining all those track casts, he thinks that the Bigfoots have a this extra joint. He calls it the mid-tarsal break. Uh, another thing shows up a little bit, not too much, is uh, this Professor Meldrum also thinks that their heel sticks out, the bottom of their foot sticks out past the heel a little bit, more so than in humans. So the ankle bone, I guess you'd say, comes down a little bit more in the center of the foot, a little forward, more forward than the human ankle bone. Then they, you know, 
The only question about this Bigfoot Patterson film is it's one of two things. Either it's a real Bigfoot or it's a man in a suit. So if it's not a man in a suit, then it has to be a Bigfoot. And people have analyzed this. Uh, they went back to this film site right after this thing was taken. There were several large trees. There was a stick on the ground right next to where this thing walked. So they were able to measure those things and then scale it up. And they figured this creature was somewhere between seven feet, <coughs> seven feet six. Most people think about seven foot three. And if that's the case, and they, uh, they also look at the width of the shoulders. And they said there's no human around who could have shoulders that wide and arms that long to fill up the suit. And it's, you know, the arms bend at the elbow. You could have really long arms in a costume, but then how do you get the elbow to bend in the right place? So the, the basic size of the, of the creature kind of uh, rules out it being a person. Not, not the height alone. There could be a person that's that tall. Uh, another thing that I didn't notice this uh, you know, studying this thing for 25 years now. It's only a couple of years ago that it struck me that uh, the chin here is lower. The bottom of the chin is lower than the top of the shoulder. So you see things on the internet that's, that says, oh, this is a video of a Bigfoot or a photo of a Bigfoot. That's one thing to watch out for. So if you just put a costume on, uh, it may very well happen that the chin is still well above the shoulder height. Another thing, if you look at the casts, uh, people don't talk about this too much, but this was a human foot. I don't know how well you can see the toes. Usually on a human foot, the big toe is a whole lot bigger than the other toes. And in the case of Bigfoot, it, the feet vary a lot, just as in humans. Some people have long, narrow feet. Some people have short, wide feet. But I think that it, that's, I, I need to do more investigation on that. But I think that's a pattern to, to look for in tracks is how large is the big toe compared to the other ones. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do a little different, which I haven't done in my other uh, uh, talks that I've given, is uh, read one of the reports from my book. But I guess, first of all, I'd like to find out where uh, every, is everybody here from St. Clair County, or who is from St. Clair County? Mm -hmm. yeah, I heard we have a couple of visitors from Canada. And so we get closer to the intermission. If anybody here has had an experience that they think might be related to Bigfoot activity, whether it's uh, finding tracks or scat or hearing unusual noises. Uh, if you'd be so kind as to stand up and tell us about it, we really appreciate that. It's, it's, uh, it's one of the main reasons I do this, to try and get in contact with some, some new witnesses. Where I, I live in the city, so uh, the only way I can find out more about Bigfoot activities is by uh, meeting people from out of the country. Or, going out in the woods, which I've done a lot of times in various areas also. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read this uh, my, this book that I have for sale, a little background on that. It's, um, it's made up of reports that I received to my, uh, my Michigan Bigfoot website. It's, uh, the name of the website is just Michigan Bigfoot, all one word, dot O-R-G. And over the years, people would write in to me and tell me if they find that website, and they'd write in and tell me about their experiences. And usually I'd write back and ask them several questions, and we'd go back and forth a few times, and then I'd eventually uh, whittle it down into a report that I would put in the book. And I, eventually I got to have so many of these that I, uh, this book comes to 130 pages. And I, some of the, most of the reports you won't find on the internet. So. Uh, here's one from St. Clair County. Well, I have, first I, I'll ask, has anyone ever heard of the reports from Yale, Michigan? Okay. Yeah, okay. I, was, uh, I have two of them in my book. One is, uh, doesn't say which, it just says newspaper report. <coughs> St. Clair County, September 1981, Yale area family reports repeated encounters on their farm. And then the Detroit News picked it up. Uh, a couple months later, 22 November 1981, the story was entitled Bigfoot in the Thumb. And the uh, basic story was the 13-year-old uh, girl, Tina Marone, went out to the barn to feed the animals, and it was near dusk or something, I think. 
and she reached inside the barn and bumped into this very large, upright, furry or hairy animal. And, uh, so that was, a lot of people have, have heard about that. I was up here several years ago getting a Christmas tree off a farm and asked the owner if they, if they ever saw Bigfoot tracks in these Christmas trees. He says, he says, oh, not here, but over in Yale. So apparently a lot of people live up here they remember the reports from Yale. Uh, I was going to just read you <clears throat> one report from St. Clair County. This was summer of 1983. It says, three teenagers see Bigfoot from a boat. And so I received this. I didn't receive it until December 2007. It happened uh, 14 years earlier. No, 20, 24 years earlier, 1983. So I have a story to tell you about a sighting that me and some old friends had. I grew up along Pine River Road near Port Huron. And I had a friend, Robert, that lived about a mile away at the corner of Pine River Road and Dove Road. We decided to take a flat bottom boat from his house to my house in the summer of 1993, going down the Pine River. His sister, Cherry, wanted to go with us, so we all got ready and left on our little boat trip. About halfway uh, along on the trip, Cherry started screaming at the top of her lungs. Bob and I started freaking out because we had no idea what was wrong. Finally, she pointed into the woods, and we both looked over to see what she was pointing at. To our amazement, we saw a creature that was very tall and hairy running over a hill about 20 yards away. Bob and I only saw it from the back, but there was no way it was a bear or anything else but a Bigfoot. Terry told us that it was looking right at us when she had first seen its face. I was 16 at the time, and now I'm 40. I can still see it in my head like it was yesterday. The color was brown to brownish red. I don't recall the smell. It took long steps and didn't take long at all before it was out of sight. We put the boat in at Dove Road Bridge at Pine River Road originally, and then we took it out at the end of the trip at Pine River Road at Ravenswood. I don't recall anything else unusual but I do remember the spot we were at was kind of shallow, so maybe the Bigfoot was using it to cross the river at that point, or maybe it had already crossed. I have always wished Terry hadn't screamed. I wanted to see its face more than anything. We all knew what we had seen, but of course, nobody believed us except my mom. She told me then she had seen one back in the early 70s from our house while she was doing dishes and looking out the window. But no one believed her either. All she told me was she was doing the dishes and she looked out the window and seen something very large and hairy walking on two legs crossing the road. She said it wasn't too far away because she could see it real good and the kitchen was on the second floor. That's kind of a typical Bigfoot report. Uh, people usually it sticks in their memories for a long time. I've talked to a lot of witnesses over the years and. A lot of times it's kind of a life-changing experience, especially if they've seen it you know, anywhere near up close within 40 or 50 yards, or sometimes closer than that. Some of the other, I guess, common, the most common type of sighting is probably one crossing the road in front of a car at night. And then there's uh, some of the more scary sightings where someone's in their house at night and they look up at a window and there's a Bigfoot staring in at them. Sometimes they'll say, well, that, the bottom of the window was you know, seven, eight feet off the ground and it's standing out there looking right at us. So it's uh, obviously quite tall. So anyways, these are for sale for $10 during the intermission, which we'll uh, have later on. Okay, well that, that is the first sign. Okay. The title of my talk is Bigfoot Myth or Reality. Okay. This is uh, one of the this graph or this chart also appears in my book, and uh, this is based on the reports in my book. There's a whole lot more reports on various websites like the BFRO <coughs> website. There's one called GCBRO. There's a, uh, several websites that have uh, Bigfoot reports. But uh, and since I wrote the book about five years ago, I've gotten quite a few more reports. But I guess the main message is. Uh, there's a lot of there's reports from most of the uh, lower peninsula that I know about, 
probably a whole lot of reports that nobody ever tells anybody else about because they don't want to be laughed at. Uh, you see some counties, like this is uh, Washtenaw County, has 25 reports. Uh, one reason for that is there's a guy named Ron Wilbanks that's been had a sighting himself, he and his mother did, and then he's been listening to police scanners for a long time and picks up a lot of reports that way. And he also knows a lot of people in Washtenaw County. Uh, Hillsdale County down here had 25 reports. That's, uh, come on in, guys. Partly due to one guy down there named Bob Hodge that's been active for quite a while. And also to another guy that I met named Larry, that Larry Johnson, that had a very close-up experience himself and then had a lot of follow-on experiences for a few years afterwards. Uh, up here, this is Oscoda County. This is uh, around the city of Mayo. The Osabo River flows through there. And I first started investigating up there back in about 1990 or 91. And uh, there's one individual up there that's had a sighting, an accidental sighting when he was about 17. And he's been going out in the woods out there and investigating things himself ever since then. So there's a whole lot of activity reported there. Okay, next slide. That's the upper peninsula. So we're only missing one report from one county. Great for a reason. Okay, we're in business now, more or less. Except for this thing moving up and down. Let's see. Oh, well, it's just right here. <coughs> That's just, uh, well, what we're going to talk about, various types of evidence, physical evidence, track casts. Okay, we, I mentioned this Patterson film made in 1967. Fortunately, nothing this good has uh, come up since then that we know about. It's possible somebody has some video or film that they're not showing, but this is the best that's available. Uh, Bob, yep. hold it there. Uh, let me point out that uh, they've finally been able to do some uh, photo analysis uh, with programs they didn't have before. And on the lower right picture, you can <coughs> now count five toes. Oh, okay. See, is there another light switch? Oh, we're on the, on the, okay. on the barn. So let me just say that if someone claims that they duplicate it, they've got to do it in a suit that's got five toes. Okay, very good. <clears throat> uh, another thing here, this shows the bottom of the foot, and one of these tracks, I believe it's this one, is a, and they made plaster cast, and then they made a print of the plaster cast. This is a copy of a copy of a copy that's supposed to be from that creature. By the way, if you have anybody has any questions or comments as we're going, just uh, feel free to join in. <coughs> That's kind of a close-up of it. So. Uh, there's a guy named M.K. Davis, who's an yeah. astronomer, has a great deal of expertise with doing things with images from faint stars, and he applied his, uh, his knowledge to the Bigfoot uh, film and stills. And uh, some of these, he would make these little loops that would be like one second of the film, and he'd play them over and over. One thing you can see, it doesn't show up too well here, but there's a, a tendon that starts at the back of your knee and goes up, and your hamstring tendon, I guess they call it. And you can see that flex when there's the weight hits, hits that leg as the foot hits, the right foot hits the ground and the weight gets supported. You can see that tendon flex in the film. It's another indication that it's not a man in the suit. But Jeff Malgram said there was an injury showing up right where you're playing on at the top of that tendon, a ball. Yeah, they, they talk about that quite a bit. They wonder if someone shot at it or what. Yeah. It wasn't bleeding, apparently, at the time. No, it was here. It's another one of these. Another uh, kind of aspect of Bigfoot's is the fact that the head doesn't seem to sit right on top of the shoulders. It's like it's it's forward and down. Um, <coughs> and that kind of shows up there. It's, even when it's not leaning forward, the, the head doesn't sit straight on top of the body. Uh, someone took close-up of this from this Patterson film and try to do an artist's impression of what it's like. And uh, one thing that 
it's kind of consistent, I think, in some of the Bigfoot reports. Is uh, Their nose can sometimes be very Caucasian-like, sometimes it's more Negroid. Uh, but and this doesn't show up especially here, but often the distance from the, the bottom of the nose to the top of the lip is a little bit bigger than in, in most people. Usually they're said to have a, a wide mouth with relatively thin lips. So this is it's an artist's impression from that film, so it's, the details could be in the mind of the artist. This is another, uh, going through some of the photographic evidence that's available. This photo was taken by Ray Wallace, and he, he admitted having faked some footprints in the past, so he's kind of doubtful, but anyways, he says that was a Bigfoot sitting on a log. That's more of a close-up of it when you get the color version and do the best you can with it. Uh, so that's uh, something that shows up really well is the ear. Well, another people talk about some Bigfoots, especially the males, having a they call a sagittal crest, where it's kind of a bony ridge on top of the skull. Gorillas have that. This was uh, part of a larger photo. Some guys were in Ohio running ATVs around or something. And ATV was coming up the hill on the left, and this uh, object was somewhere in the picture off to the right. Some people think it's got some, like it's carrying something over its shoulder. Not very good. This was taken up on a place called Star Mountain in the middle of the winter in Oregon or Washington State. This guy was on one ridge and a couple hundred yards away he saw this figure walking in the very deep snow. Uh, he didn't think it was a human. Hard to tell. At first he thought it was a rock till it stood up. Oh, I'd okay. seen that film. Okay. Yep, and he's filmed the, the mountain, and, you know, like yeah. just the scenery. Mm -hmm. What he thought was a rock stood up, mm -hmm. faced him, turned around, and that's it, walking away. The only thing I can think is if it was a human wearing a heavy coat in the winter, you might not see the gap between the arm and the body. Mm -hmm. The arms do seem relatively long. Now, you can go to, the, I can go to the zoo and get some really good photos of gorillas because they'll sit out on the, the grass 50 feet away and pose for you. <coughs> Bigfoots never seem to hang around. When they see people, you might see them for a second or two, and then the, usually what they want to do is just leave the area or get hidden. Uh, this comes from Caseville, Michigan. This was uh, drawn by a lady who is now a chiropractor out in Colorado. At the time, she was about 10 years old and they were having a weenie roast on the sand dunes uh, of Lake Saginaw Bay up there in Michigan Thumb. And they were playing hide and seek and they ran up in the dunes and she saw this creature that was about four feet tall and this was, uh, she was kind of looking up at it. She said, there was a full moon and this is what it looked like. That's her drawing of what she saw. Very long arms. She mentioned having like uh, long fingernails or claws, which is kind of unusual. I think the head is kind of molded into the, into the body in the picture. Yeah, well, that's just that's her impression of what she saw. It was hunched over, looking down at her, and that's what it looked like. Now, this was done by a lady I knew in uh, near Newcomerstown, Ohio, where I investigated for those two summers. And uh, a couple things about her drawing: the eyes are very round. Uh, usually, human eyes. If you look at yourself in the mirror, your eyes kind of almond shaped, the part of your eye that shows uh, beyond your eyelids. I have some, uh, I'll show later on, I have some videos of what look like it's reflecting eyes uh, at night and they seem to be round and not almond shaped. This is where I was talking about the distance between the nose and the lip, but kind of a wide mouth, and thin lips. And then the, uh, this whole part of the, the jaw usually sticks out more in front of the face than it would on the human. And well, they always talk about, some people say, well, Bigfoot has no neck. It's, Actually, I think all mammals have seven vertebrae in their neck. It's just that they they have very large, what they call trapezius muscles that come extend from the shoulder up to the neck. You see Olympic weightlifters and wrestlers sometimes they have that appearance to some extent. Uh, Bob, yep. uh, you had a question for this young man here. He... Oh, sure. Sorry. Um, okay. Is it possible that she could have seen a bear the last couple of slideshows ago? <coughs> we saw in the sand dunes. Yeah. Uh, there's a guy named Dr. John Bindernagel who's a 
PhD biologist who wrote a book about Bigfoot. And also he points out the difference between bears and Bigfoot. So it might be in this, it's in this pamphlet also. He uh, said, you know, most people, if you've seen a bear in a zoo, or see it standing up with the circus training bears, you just don't see the shoulders. And they talk about having really wide shoulders and, you know, the lack of a snout. A bear has a very long snout, has ears on top of its head. And it's always possible that people mistake bears for Bigfoots. I went to one of these talks in Ohio. There was a guy there from Colorado who was a, held some world records in archery hunting. And uh, his father said that he saw a Bigfoot once, and this guy asked his father, who was also a really good hunter, he said, well, maybe it was a bear. He said, his dad got so mad at him, he went to talk to him for a while. He said, I think I'm so stupid, I don't know. It's a bear from, a, from something that's not a bear. But people that aren't familiar with wildlife, I mean, depending how good a view you have, it's possible some of the Bigfoot sightings are, are mistaken bears. It's possible. Uh, this is a drawing done by Igor Burtsev's daughter. This lady is Janice Carter. I wrote a book called uh, 50 Years with Bigfoot. Supposedly, her grandfather injured a, uh, a juvenile Bigfoot before she was born. By when she was felling trees and the, the tree hit this young Bigfoot and injured it. He didn't know what it was at the time, but he, he brought it in the house and kind of patched it up and started wrecking the house and put it in a locket it in a stall, a horse stall in his barn. And it started getting better and then he said the two parents came along. He saw these two Bigfoots over at the barn, ripped the boards off the side of the, board, the barn and go in and destroy the horse stall and take their, their young one with them. So this young one grew up and it kept following this guy around the farm and he started feeding it. And then it stayed, it hung around there for 50 years. And uh, here it's coming and asking for uh, food or I think it was garlic or something. But anyways, other than photographic evidence, the best idea of what a Bigfoot looks like would probably come from <coughs> you've seen them you know, and work with a, a good artist. So possibly this is pretty much what a Bigfoot looks like. It's certainly big enough. And uh, there again, it's got the, the forward kind of head and the, uh, the, the sagittal crest of the dome-shaped skull. You have a question there? Another question? Oh, yes. Oh, I watched on the Amazon and there's a show called Finding Bigfoot. And on this one that I watched, it talks about this um, uh, person. Um, Bigfoot would like bring dead snakes and they would like to her yeah. back door. Yeah, they, he oh. has a friend. Oh, I didn't see that episode. Yeah, yeah I, I know people who've camped yeah. out in the woods with them and a lady who says they hang around your house. And that's one thing they'll do. They'll bring little gifts to people. If they like people, they'll uh, bring them little gifts. One time they brought her a little hair ribbon. Another time it was when I was out visiting, uh, she had this little place where she'd feed them. And they found this smiley faced helium balloon. It could have blown in there because if you let it go, it would have went up in the air. So something brought that balloon into this wooded area near her house and wrapped the string around a bush near where she was feeding them. So that is uh, one of the ways that Bigfoot seem to interact with, uh, with people. Sometimes they'll, they'll have a little gift exchange. You leave them an apple or something, and they might leave you a, a nice little stone. So you, have to, you have to be aware of that if you're, if you're in your area. Yeah, that means some deer animals. This is the, uh, the cover photo on this book, 50 Years with Bigfoot. I've sold out recently. I have to have more of them printed. But uh, if you, anyone wants to email me and buy a copy of the book, I should have at least brought one around for people to look at. Uh, this is another artist's conception. It's not a photograph, but uh, uh, personally, when I first saw this, I kind of I was kind of startled. It looks a little scary. And there again, it shows you know, the long arms. And people say they have very large hands also. And there again, see the chin is probably a little bit lower than the shoulders. So. <coughs> That's another version of that. And people say they're, they're often quite muscular. This Patterson film was apparently a rather sort of hefty, maybe a little overweight female. This is, you won't tell them that. 
<coughs> this drawing was done quite a while ago and sent to me. This shows the, uh, the bend in the foot that I was talking about earlier. And another kind of characteristic I've heard people talk about is when they walk, their, their wrists will kind of flip-flop around loosely. You can kind of see that in the Patterson film. I'm going to show that later on. I'll show it at regular speed and also in slow motion. Pay attention to that little feature. And there again, we got the, the chin is lower than the shoulder. and the, They don't always have this crowned head, but it's reported fairly often. And who knows, for, uh, in North America we have black bears, we have grizzly bears, we have polar bears, and the Alaska brown bears might or might not be exactly the same as grizzlies. I'm not sure if they're classified as a different species. So it's possible we have more than one type of Bigfoot in the U.S. Even in Africa with the gorillas, they have the lowland gorillas and the mountain gorillas, which are considered to be two different species. And among chimps, there's four different uh, varieties of chimpanzees, and then there's something that they used to call the pygmy chimp, which now they say is not a chimp, it's called a bonobo or bonobo. And I've seen one of those up close in the zoo. When you look at them and look at them in the face, they, they seem like they're, they're more intelligent than a chimp. They just, they just found that one in the Congo, it's called the Billy Ape. It yeah. stands almost five foot tall. Glad you mentioned that. That was <laughs> starting five or six years ago. They're called the lion killer. Yep. There's some very world famous photographer named Carl Amann, I think, from Germany. He went down there and spent months trying to film these things. And they got a, a couple of pictures. There was a dead one that the natives had. They took a picture of it. So I said, well, it's just an overgrown chimp. Most chimps weigh between uh, the males will get around 120 to 140 pounds. I saw one in the zoo that was 200, but it was kind of fat. And they said, well, maybe this was just an extra large chimp. Has anyone found any bones of Bigfoot? Oh, yeah, I'll get to that in a minute. That's a good question. But uh, anyways, the, the, the interesting thing with the Billy Apes is they're so hard to find. Just like people say, well, if Bigfoot's out there, why can't just people go out in the woods and find him and photograph him? And they did, someone did get one little video shot of a, one of these Billy Apes up in a tree. You know, it was just kind of see the gray leg. You couldn't see the whole thing. But that's, it's very interesting if there's another... So these would be bigger than your average chimp, but smaller than a gorilla. So if there's a whole new species of ape running around in Africa that has never been captured and put in a zoo, they don't have a you know, recently killed specimen, if something like that can exist, then why can't Bigfoot exist? Uh, as for the bones, that would be great if we had more bones. There's, um, I think this Melville Ketchum study where they did DNA analysis, there might have, uh, no, they didn't have bone. When I, I, apparently they do have a, a large thigh bone that's about 50% longer than a human thigh bone. And they're going to do some DNA analysis on that to see if that's Bigfoot or not. There's a whole lot of reports that people have found not looking in Bigfoot books or monster books. Someone will be, for instance, <coughs> reading a, a town history of some little town in Pennsylvania and it'll be a paragraph in there that will say, back in 1824 when we dug the foundation for our new church, we ran across this skeleton that was eight feet tall or something. And they'd always say, well, it must have been giant Indians. And there you, if you, there's a lot of these reports on record, but there's no museum that has any of these bones on display. I don't know why that is. But, uh, presently, uh, there's no, no one recognized bones <coughs> from Bigfoot that anybody has in their possession except maybe this new one that I just saw on the internet a couple of weeks ago. If they did have a bone, then they could do some good DNA analysis. Find out what kind of species it is. This is uh, some guy in Ohio who, who's had some real experiences in his life. Well, he sent me some good reports of being a kid when his dad went someplace and this Bigfoot was, they had this big wooden door of the house and Bigfoot was pushing on it and the door was bending but it didn't break. But anyways, he was good at photoshopping. So he, this is what you can do with Photoshop on the internet. It's a completely fake thing. He just took a picture of himself and somehow put all this Bigfoot thing in there. That would be about the, the typical size, I guess, seven and a half to eight feet. That's another thing, all these Bigfoot reports, if you if you saw a Bigfoot and you wanted people to believe you, 
you might say it was seven feet tall or seven and a half feet tall, but there's people who swear they've seen them, you know, nine, even ten feet tall. Some of these, they see some, they'll see them standing next to like a tree branch or a tree with a horizontal branch. And they'll say, yeah, its head came right up to that branch. You go over and measure it, you know, it's really up there. So how big they get is a good question. They certainly get up to probably, uh, if they exist, they get up to eight feet tall and maybe taller. I've got some very large footprint photographs to show you later on also. Uh, well, that's what we're getting into here. It's very hard to see a Bigfoot or get a photo of one yourself, but uh, tracks are probably the most common form of evidence. Wow, I've seen tracks myself I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 times over the years. Some of these out in places where nobody knew, knew that I was going on that particular day. And it kind of makes you think you know, you're half a mile from your car out in the middle of the woods and you come across some of these tracks. You start looking over your shoulder. <laughs> That's the one I, when I showed you before. This is the uh, Roger Patterson, the guy, one of the two guys that took the film. He was holding the camera, and these are the, the cast they took that same day. I, he was his partner was uh, Bob Gimlin. Roger Patterson. No, but yeah, Bob Gimlin, right? I met Bob at an Ohio Bigfoot conference a couple years ago. He uh, he was there, and he. You know, she says that's that's what really happened. It was the real thing. That's uh, often when you find them in the in the mud, you see these great big impressions, but because of soil conditions and everything, you don't see all the toes real well. The, uh, this one came from New York State. Uh, that's another thing. They got both the length and the width, and I've heard that. Uh, so like the NBA basketball players that are seven feet tall, their feet will get up to 16, 17 inches long. They usually don't get a whole lot wider than regular people's feet. Yeah, so if you look at the, if you take the width and divide by the length, the, uh, the ratio is, can be different for Bigfoot tracks, where they tend to be proportionally wider. Also, uh, if you're like in a swimming pool and you see, uh, Someone gets out of the pool and with wet feet and walks across the cement. You see this whole area of the foot won't show up because that's, humans have an arch. So uh, Bigfoots are almost universally flat-footed. So when you see their tracks, you don't see the uh, part in here where the arch would be. Uh, these are tracks I found in the snow out in Washtenaw County, out past Ann Arbor. There's a human track, and you can see the, the heel and the, the line between the heel and the sole and some lug marks. And, uh, that was a, an adult track, and then we saw this other thing. It's kind of vague. It looks like toes up there, and it's very large. Uh, that right there must be the metatarsal break at uh -oh. this edge of where it goes to the ground. Right. Yeah. Right yeah. Maybe so. <clears throat> now, it wasn't real fresh snow. That day it was about 40 degrees yeah. out in the... Snow was getting mushy. We went past that footprint. We came to a lake that was about maybe a quarter mile across, not a real big lake. And the lake was covered with this, uh, it was still icy. You could walk on the ice, but it was turning kind of slushy stuff. And about 100 yards from shore, we found several of these size bare footprints. So my friend took off his shoe and sock and made this footprint for comparison. Like I said here, you can see his toe is relatively large compared to the other ones. His arch isn't showing up, I don't know. But uh, we thought that was real interesting to find small barefoot tracks out on a frozen lake in the winter and there weren't any people around. That's another one there. Some sign of toes. That's just a kind of a vague thing in the snow. Now this was uh, February 2011, about a half mile from where we had found these on the lake a few years earlier. A friend and I found about oh, at least 50 of these tracks in the snow. And if you see footprints in the snow that could possibly be Bigfoot, there are certain things to look for. This snow is probably six or seven inches deep. Uh, 
even when there's a half inch or an inch of snow on the ground and a person walks in a normal uh, in a normal fashion, you usually drag your heel. If you're ever walking in the snow, look behind yourself at your own footprints, there'll usually be a drag mark. Also, when people walk, usually their toes point out to the side. Your right foot will be angled a little bit to the right, your left foot to the left. And uh, also, you can, with a human, the right footprints would be here and here, and the left footprints would be over in, on the side. It's called straddle. And what's typical of Bigfoots is the steps are almost one directly in front of the other, and uh, none of this, none of the foot drag. They lift their feet up like they're marching, apparently. That was really interesting to have found these tracks that day. Unfortunately, uh, snow had drifted into some of them. We couldn't find toe prints in them, but nearby uh, along the road where the snow had been plowed, we did find one track that showed the toe prints. This was just up north. Uh, so this happened when a guy was out looking for mushrooms in, I think, early April. That's a sort of a common thing that mushroom hunters run into Bigfoots here occasionally. Probably both looking for the same food. Same track there. In the, uh, the young man that found the track, he had also heard noises within about 50 feet over a little hill, but he never saw anything. This is from Hillsdale County. Uh, about five years ago, Mark, were you, were you with yeah. me at that time when yeah. we met Bob Hodge? Yeah. He was one of the guys that, that found this big series of tracks. It was, I think, in like, I think it was in uh, Curra during March or something. They followed these for quite a ways, and these are some of the biggest Bigfoot tracks ever recorded. You can kind of see the toes up there. So who knows how big that one was? Feet. Yeah. 15. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, after the uh, little intermission, I'll show you some of my video, but I want to give you an introduction of what it's about. If you just see the video, it doesn't make too much sense. Uh, this is this, this road went through a little valley. There was a big wooded ridge that ran this way on one side of the road, this way on the other side. And uh, this particular spot was the narrowest part of the valley with the fewest people. It was a good place for them to cross. Uh, when I show you the video, there's, see there's this object right there that walks from here to this utility pole. My wife was sitting in the, this is my blue station wagon, she had the tailgate up. She was reading a book. She said she heard some rustling in the bushes and went back to reading her book. And then a friend of mine from work, it was the first time she'd ever used a video camera. She wasn't even looking through the viewfinder. She was just panning around taking scenery pictures. And she didn't know she had this on her video. So this was in August, and she didn't give me the video till uh, October. Between August and October, the family that lived in the house right around the corner had moved out, and the new owner wouldn't let me go on the, on the property. But if we had realized at the time that she had this on video, what we would have done was had a person walk the same path and then you get a better idea how tall it was. The, uh, the road is kind of elevated above the, uh, where the weeds are growing. The land dropped off a couple of feet, so it's hard to tell how tall this little figure is. But we'll see more of that later on. Now, I spent two summers down there trying to get video, and this lady comes down there just by accident. She gets the best video from the two years. Also, when I show you later on, there's some white object that moves in, in the background here. Oh, I don't know. There we go. Okay, we'll see. So that's more of the same. We tried playing around with the improving the photo and we overdid it on that one. It wasn't really brown at You can only, whether it's moving across the field, you can only do so much with these older videos, not even high definition video, they're only, I don't know, 100, 100 horizontal lines or something like that. The other video I have uh, involves this white creature inside this abandoned building. When it starts off, this part of the wall still has the boards on it, and the 
this creature comes in the house. This is the corner of the house. There's a side window over there. And about 50, 40, 50 feet away, I had a, a motion detector light that when something came in the building, it would detect the motion and the spotlight would come on for a while. So this thing moves around in there. It knocks this hole in the wall. We're using a two by four. And then there was a, a 18 wheeler truck tire that weighed well over 100 pounds. It kicks that off out from in front of the door. And then it throws out a, not a cinder block, but a solid cement block. It grabs it with its wrist and just flips it out of the, the house. Mm. Oh. So we think that was a young Bigfoot. I also have, uh, this door was uh, 6 feet 10 inches tall. And I'll show you some of the videos where you see a pair of eyes up in this area looking out the, the doorway. Yes. Fortunately, that's as good as it gets. Oh, there we go. Now, these are very wide, very, very wide set eyes. It's, uh, the door, I think, was doorway was 30 inches wide. Uh, there was a sort of a territorial thing with this little abandoned house. It was about 12 by 24. It had two rooms. And my theory is the Bigfoots thought this was their place. And it was about at least 200 feet from the main house and out of sight around bend in the road. And when I would try to block this doorway up, whenever I blocked the doorway up the next morning, it would be knocked out of place. That's a little, same picture, a little more exposure. Yeah, you just can't get any better than that. Uh, here's another daytime color photo that I, I had an old fashioned game tracker with film in it. You could you know, take 24 pictures and maybe you have developed. The camera was on a tree about four feet chest height to me off the ground. It was uh, inside a, a strong fiberglass case and there was a, a cable, a metal cable that went around the tree. And there was also a, uh, a ratcheting nylon strap, a one inch strap that attached it to the tree. <coughs> This is what the photo looks like. Uh, some people tell me, oh, that's just a glove. And, uh, I've been looking at it for a long time. I think this is the lower part of the jaw. And this is uh, like maybe the mouth. These are probably the nostrils. And I think this is the brow ridge. People say, if you look at a lot of Bigfoot reports, they have a heavy brow ridge, heavy bony area right, you know, right above their eyes. And this, I think, is a hairy arm. This, is, this little bit here is the chest muscle connecting the arm to the shoulder, kind of. And that's probably the elbow to the little bit of bend. And see, the, the way I got this photo, this thing was a lot taller than the camera, and it grabbed the camera and jerked it up. So it's, if you ever stand at night with a, <coughs> a flash, turn the lights off, hold <coughs> a flashlight at your waist, shine it up on your face, it makes kind of a scary face. <coughs> that's what the camera was. It's <coughs> down at the waist level of this creature. No, that's the sky and the pine trees up there. <coughs> well, this nylon strap was ripped. But, uh, I think when this thing is ripped apart, you get a frayed effect. If you cut it with a knife, it might be a nice, or scissors would be a nice straight cut. This was a frayed kind of thing. So that was in the uh, Huron National Forest, about 10 miles from Iowa, in Oscoda County. The other one, that's just a close-up of this. Definitely something in the photo, but what it is is hard to say. So. Well, <clears throat> all I can say personally, this was within a few hundred yards of where we had camped with other people several times, seen lots of tracks, saw droppings, had bait messed around with, and then the, the highlight was finally getting this photo. I put the, can, the, the game tracker up one more time. The next time I put it up, found it laying on the ground out of that fiberglass case somehow they got it open the back of the camera was popped open and I had four <coughs> silver uh, C cell batteries in there all that was missing was one of the silver batteries I think if a person had done it that camera at the time cost $500 <coughs> so 
quite a while back when the game trackers were new, we got three of us chipped in to buy this $500 camera. <coughs> but it was a person messing with my camera. They, they passed up the $500 camera just to play tricks on me. This uh, photo of field appeared in the Field and Stream uh, photo contest for game trackers a while back. And I think it was called Blasting Through. Apparently, the thing is moving pretty rapidly, which is why it's kind of blurred. And uh, who knows? This close-up of it. Um, I've got another photo I'm going to show you from the, this Adrian Erickson project. Maybe you've all heard of that. And the two photos are similar. You get this kind of unexpected curve to the face, like this. Maybe this is bushy hair hanging out, sticking out over the forehead. And this would be maybe the, the uh, mouth sticking out forward from the face. See that a little bit more there. Now this is this uh, Adrian Erickson photo that was, this guy bought a property in uh, Kentucky I don't know, not that far south of Cincinnati, where Bigfoots were said to hang around, and he stationed a biologist and a videographer there. He paid their salaries. And they lived there for, I think, a year or something like that. And they got some video. He claims he's got a lot more video, but this is all that's been released. So I think this kind of looks like that, uh, facially, like the, the one in that field and stream photo, which was taken a few years before this. And it looks like the... Here again, see there's quite a distance because that's the bottom of the nose and the distance from there, the upper lip's kind of large, sort of sticking forward. That's, this, when you see the video, this thing slowly turns its head to face the camera. So that's uh, as good as it gets. This is... Uh, yeah, photo taken in uh, Pennsylvania by a game tracker. Uh, the game tracker on the same roll of film, I guess, or same, at about the same time, got some bear cubs running around in there. And they don't look very much like this, but people try to say, well, this was a bear cub. To me, the legs are much too long to be a bear. I mean, this, that's the arm. It's a very long arm. I always thought if I could take this to a, a zookeeper's convention, Hey, Bob, if I'm not mistaken, I've seen that one redone. Yeah. And what it actually was was a crow flying close to the camera. And it was catching its wings when it's flapping down like that. And it was that, it was, and that's what, it was pretty, pretty much, that's what they decided it was. You sure it's not the Kentucky picture with yeah, the swings? I think that's a different film. Think so? Yeah, this like is supposed that. to be a juvenile. Uh, yeah, this see, one, you know, that was caught on camera. Yeah, this is zoomed in. When I, I see, I've seen the one you talk about too. Yeah, yeah I, I know the one that with the crow explanation. Yeah, I think that was a different photo. Yeah, yeah, I, this doesn't show the whole photo was a lot bigger than this. I just zoomed in on the uh, interesting part. Uh, anyways, hard to say. Be nice if somebody got some really high quality photos. This somebody took out near Milford, I think when they were canoeing or something, they saw this object here. And uh, part of the lesson with this is, if you ever are lucky enough to get a, have a photo where there's something in it that looks like a Bigfoot, often you, people won't realize it at the time. Try to go back later on and duplicate the photo. Use the same camera, same time of day. Have a person go back and stand where you think the Bigfoot was. And it means a lot more. This could just be a stump back there. Uh, I hadn't thought too much about Bigfoots and stick structures till about three or four years ago when this guy named Igor Burtsev came over here from Russia and was visiting us and he started pointing them out. And since then I've noticed a whole lot more. Uh, for this one, it's noticed a big curvature in there. Often you walk around in the woods, you see these brush tangles and fallen branches and stuff, you don't think too much about it. This is up near Traverse City. Uh, this just didn't happen by itself, I don't think. Could have been some fraternity boys playing tricks, but you know why bother? It's a, these logs weigh probably weigh, weigh at least a couple hundred pounds. 
Jewish quarterback. Some people think Bigfoots do this as trail markers or to mark their territory or something or other. And uh, you see these complex things where you can be sure they didn't fall that way. Things are interweaved and stuck in at different strange angles. Uh, <clears throat> now there's Mark. Remember? <laughs> yeah. This is up in the uh, Pier State game area north of the pier. My friend, there's two, this is Mark Curtis in the audience here. This is my friend Mark Azafai. But he was out there deer hunting. He had a game tracker he put up. And his game tracker was on back in this area. Maybe, maybe the photo's in here. But uh, took a photo and got these two reflecting eyes. And then there's this bent branch, which is at least this broken branch, three inches thick, solid live maple. It just happens to uh, bar the way down the trail? Oh, I don't know if that was the, yeah, possibly that was the intent. Oops, uh, gee, I'm just, I should have the photo of the eyes in here, but I don't. This was up right near where my picture, my game tracker photo was taken that I showed you earlier of the, the apparent face. Uh, so my friends had been up there camping, and I got up there late. They left before I got there, and they said just before they left, they had 10 or 12 rounds of ammunition left, so they shot it all off, and they went home. When I got up to the campsite, there had been these uh, cut stumps about this big around and a foot and a half, two feet high around the campfire. <coughs> they were throwing all over the place. There was a, a tree trunk about uh, 20 feet long and way a foot and a half thick that was drugged across the two-track. And then further down the trail, this thing was about foot and a half worth of roots and about six, seven feet long and it was stuck ten feet up in the uh, evergreen branches. And uh, this was hard packed sandy soil. I couldn't even grab a ceiling that was two feet tall and rip it out of the ground. So whatever pulled this out of the ground had to be really strong. What county was that? Um, or what's the county? location? I, uh, Oscoda County. Oscoda, yeah. In the, Those uh, are pine trees. In the uh, that, what's, that, what's the national forest? Osama? You're on, isn't it? You're on national yeah. forest, right? <clears throat> this is a baiting technique I used to use. Put out bait for Bigfoots, and how do you know the raccoons aren't going to take it? So I take a milk crate like that, and get it up real tight against a very large tree trunk, and put some bait in. I had a couple times when some kind of spectacular things happened. Uh, that's the last one. Yeah, so if anyone uh, has had any interesting things that's happened to them, or if you have a friend or relative that's ever mentioned anything about a possible Bigfoot sighting, I'm always glad to have you share. One reason I do these things, I hope to find somebody who says, oh yeah, I, th I think they, they hang around my house sometimes. Uh, running around in the woods trying to find a Bigfoot is pretty hard to do. They're very elusive when I'm on the scene. If you're brave enough to camp out with them, sometimes they'll come and mm -hmm. sneak around your campsite at night. But there's other situations. It's one reason I do this is try to help people out. I've worked with people in northern Ohio, southern Ohio, uh, northern Kentucky, and western Michigan. And I've had Bigfoots that hang around their house off and on, off, often for a period of years. They might not see something might not happen for a couple months at a time and then some kind of dramatic thing will happen. And so these people are just, there's another place in Northern Michigan, it's five or six. There are some people are just absolutely terrified by it now. They think it's some kind of a monster, there's only one in the whole world and it's on their property. So I try to explain to them that these things have been around for a long time and they, they generally don't hurt people and uh, you know just try to get along with them and probably good not to feed them. People would have fed them, then they can get to be pests like bears can be. More, become more uh, more of a pest if you feed them too much. So there's no record of them hurting anybody then? Yeah, that's a good, good question. If they have, the police have decided have decided not to report it. I've heard, you know, I've heard stories, but no official reports. There was, uh, I was out visiting a guy in uh, Oregon, Portland, and he said, there was a story up there that a young man and his girlfriend were walking on a trail and 
saw a Bigfoot and the lady screamed at the top of her lungs and said the Bigfoot just tore her in half or something. But it never got reported that way. So who knows, it's just hearsay. Uh, generally, these, if these things wanted to hurt you, you wouldn't have a chance. I've had a lot of rocks thrown at me, uh, usually little pebbles. I'll be walking along and or there'd be brush behind me and I'll go like that because instinctively if you see something coming at you from behind, it'll turn around. I've seen like a little rock or even a piece of bark hit the ground. One time it was a little piece of car chrome, a little piece of stupid car chrome. And, uh, other times we'd be out on the road in this area, there's a lot of trees around, you hear like pop, 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 and there'd be a rock hitting tree branches. Uh, 40 feet up going through the woods and then it ended up landing in the road. Another time I got to saw, I climbed up a tree to saw off the branches because I had a camera in a second story window and it was the branches were kind of blocking the view. It's the middle of the daytime and I'm sawing this top of this tree off and from about, uh, it's more than half a football field away there were some pine trees and rocks were being thrown at me from over there and landing in the creek down below. Another time uh, they this place I went to, they'd like to throw rocks on it. Their garage had a tin roof. And they, apparently they like to hear them hit the tin roof. The rocks didn't break the houses and the windows very often. But uh, they had a little wishing well in the backyard, about this high. I went and hid behind that, and those rocks would come out of the woods, maybe 50, 60 feet away. They could hit that roof every time. But they very, uh, one, I was, one rock brushed my cheek, it was coming from behind me. There were two cases where family members got hit by somewhat larger rocks, but they weren't throwing real hard, like the size of a baseball, and they got a bruise from it. But I think if these things wanted to, they could kill you with a rock from quite a distance just by throwing it really hard. Or if they wanted to you know, run up to you and smack you one, you'd be dead probably. Mm -hmm. That's one reason I'm willing to go out in the woods and, and mess around where I think they are, is I believe that uh, in almost all cases, they're not trying to hurt people. How would you know in the woods where to go, where would they, where would they be? Well, you look for where there's been reports and you find them on the internet and various places. And, uh, in Michigan, if you go to the state game areas, the state recreation areas, you don't want to go to the right, right into a state park campground where there's people camping. <coughs> but if you get in the, like the Rifle River recreation area, there's some camping areas there. If you get in the, the back woods where only the hunters go in hunting season, there's been reports. So generally you, you look for, uh, like my book tells a lot of places where there's been reports. You go into those areas and as you go around the woods, you may find uh, some of the, you get uh, good at finding these branch structures. I can do a whole presentation just on the unusual branch structures and things. You look for that, you look for tracks. Uh -huh. So there's a possibility that on the right-hand corner you've got a fractured tree? Up there? Yep. Okay. Well, no, this looks a little unusual. Yeah. Okay. We see a lot of bent trees in the woods, but I was up north last summer and there was this maple tree about this big. It would have been about 20, 25 feet high. It was bent not just like this, but all the way over and then the top pointed back down towards its base. You know, what in the world did that? Uh, How come there's so many names for all these? Well, I, yeah, and in the U.S. they, they call them Bigfoot, and the, yeah. the Canadians they call them Sasquatch. Yeah. The Americans, glad you mentioned that. The, the, Indians, the American yeah. Indians, I've heard of all the different tribes, and there's probably 30 different languages in the U.S. Every, almost every tribe, or very nearly every, maybe every tribe has a name for something called Sasquatch. China has their what they call that, the abominable snowman, basically. Yep. In, in New York State, they call them Wotico or Wendigo. I worked with a guy who was a Native American and grew up on a reservation in northern New York State, and I asked him about it once. He said, yeah, when I was a little kid, my grandmother yeah. told me, if you don't behave, the wind is going to go on the It's very widespread among the Native Americans. Blue, blue man. Anybody blue. wants to? Well, maybe there's a water fountain. It's kind of warm in here. I'm getting a little thirsty. So nobody has seen that here. Uh, well, my friend Tom had a, a nighttime sighting. He, was, he spent all night in a little deer blind up near Petoskey and uh, got a, a glimpse of something for a while. Uh, I've had three sort of possible sightings, not 
not only, they call them like class A or class B, these were kind of class D. Right? Couldn't say it was a big foot. I saw something, well, maybe, possibly could have been. Not like the people that see one across the road, you know, 30 feet in front of their car, or people horseback riding have seen it. Or the worst thing, you look out the kitchen window and right up in the kitchen. Two residents of uh, Homer St. Clair County. Talk about some, uh, there are two sightings here in Richmond, Michigan this fall, within a, a week or two and a few miles of each other. So, Tom Thomas and uh, Derek Schneider, you want to go up and go ahead, Tom, let it fly. No, can we go first? Sure. All right. I'm trying to think when this happened. It happened this year. About three weeks ago. Oh, the beginning yeah. of, no, no, beginning of October. Uh, back in uh, July, uh, there's a medical clinic on 32 Mile Road in just outside of Richmond. That's a Henry Ford clinic, but there's a, a pharmacy there. And the, my pharmacist, where he stands behind his counter, he can look out the big glass door and there's a, the parking lot and then there's a big grass lawn area then there's a full patch of woods over there. One evening he was working the late shift at the pharmacy. Just before the sun went down, he saw something that looked to be a lot taller than me, and I'm six foot two, uh, wearing a dark colored coat, or brown fur, walk out of the woods into that lawn area, and then turn around and walk back in. And as I had told him about Bigfoot, this guy's from Lebanon and <laughs> lives in Dearborn. He, you know, yeah. but he drives, you know, clear out to Richmond to run that pharmacy. It was just a very brief sighting. And now Eric can tell you what, or I can tell it. Go ahead. You uh, know it. Eric and I and Bob have a friend that's, is he a TV producer? Or right. He runs Channel he 6 runs TV. He runs Channel 6, right. And he's not a big believer. Uh, what's all the little towns you can get that? Armada. Channel? Anyway, Bill is his name, right? Yep. Yeah. Bill is coming, I'm guessing. North. North. He was going welding. on 32 mile road. No, he's not welding. At Armada and Ridge. he turned on Welding Road to go up to get on Armada Ridge to go over to Armada where he lives. And this was, that was in what, September? Just about done. Maybe end of September, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, his wife's with him, he drove along, and a Bigfoot walked across the road in front of him. What, did he say what color it was, or dark well, it color? Was, it, had, it had just gotten like pretty dark, so it was just dark to him. It was, you know, so it was, I bet it was the same one that the pharmacist saw. Yeah, it's only about it a mile by. Like a quarter of a mile from each other, and this was two months ago. So maybe they're from the ones that hang around my house. Who knows? I have some interesting things happen in my place. But I don't know what it is. I haven't seen anybody yet. It's They play games with me, and I've just tried out some art, and I can't do it. <laughs> They break my camera. They stole my salt block. If you ever pick up a salt block? They weigh 50 pounds. I mean, for somebody to carry one of them off, it's got to be pretty dusty. I mean, 20 years ago, I could carry one. I could carry one now, but I don't want, why would I? <laughs> why do you a salt block? I pulled, I pulled one out of my backyard, and I aimed my game camera at it to get pictures of the critters at nighttime. And it was August 10th. I had it out there, and I had been taking pictures for a whole month of uh, the deer and the neighbor's cats and the neighbor's dogs. There's only four houses in the area where I live. It's all wooded and farming. Uh, August 10th, I had pictures of deer at nighttime. August 11th, I went to the doctor, and on the way back home, we had a real bad rainstorm. That was the one that flooded most of Warren and Detroit, that rainstorm. And I got home, I, every day I'd look out to see if my salt block was out there, and I looked out there and it's gone. So I went out there and I took my game camera off of the tree, or just took the SD card out of it, brought it back in the house to look at it. It took pictures up until that night, the 10th and early morning of the 11th, and then the pictures stopped, not really stopped, but the camera took over a thousand photos, daytime shots of the area where the salt block was. 
If that would have been a human that took it, I would have had his picture. But they say a Bigfoot has something in them that can disrupt cameras and make them go crazy. It's happened to me three times now. One time of 3,000 pictures. I don't know what they can do, but... And I don't know if it was a Bigfoot. I can't prove it. Right, right. But, and my neighbor's salt block, uh, Bob came out to my house in October. It was broke then, right? Yeah. But prior to that, he had a salt block, but he's a hunter. And uh, it was totally intact. And uh, when Bob came out, we drove past it on my ATV, and it was cut at an angle, broke. And that little piece left on the ground, but there was a little chunk. It's gone. So I asked the guy that owns the salt block, or the that piece of land, what happened to his salt block? He said, oh, the rain just wore it down. I said, no way. Not in that short of time. And that angle. Right. That, he didn't know what happened to it. They say that it's only a bigger deal carry it with one arm. Oh, yeah. Oh, I wonder what they do with salt. Well, that's probably what well, they... Well, uh, I don't know a lot about animals, but animals have to have salt, just right. like us. And a lot of Bigfoot sightings are seen in gravel pits. Or you could get mineral out of the gravel pit. Mm -hmm. So why would they do it? Take a whole saw block. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, I could talk forever about big. How is your camera? <laughs> huh? How is the camera that you bought? The what? The game camera? Yeah. It's as soon as I went, took it back in the house. I took all the batteries out. I checked them with the meter. The, nothing was wrong with the batteries. It only runs on batteries. On the yeah. It takes camera. twelve. Well, double A, and I called Bush now and explained it to them, and they said it's probably your passive infrared sensor with malfunction. Okay. But I checked all the batteries, put the well, camera back, and it works fine. Well, and there was a little spot on the grass about this big around. Say my camera's like five feet away on this mm -hmm. tree, that the grass is gone. No weeds were pulled out. That it wasn't burnt. It's just gone. I think you would have some footprints someplace, huh? I don't know. They, 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 I don't know how they don't leave footprints. Yeah. I mean, you can find them, but that particular day, it hadn't rained yet, so the ground was still so kind of hard, them, yeah. and it's grass. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's a mystery. <laughs> it's a <big> mystery. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see if I can. I have some uh, movies on the disc. I can play. This is the uh, Roger Patterson film as it was originally taken. The guy jumped off his horse and he was running around and the camera was shaking like crazy. There's some de debate whether he had his camera set at 24 or 20 frames per second or something. You don't know exactly at what speed the film should be showing. For that wall being gray, the picture comes out pretty, yeah. pretty good. Then it goes to slow motion, I think. Or 60, 67. Oh, really? That long ago? Yeah. Now, this lady that wrote the 50 Years with Bigfoot book, she said the ones on her farm in Tennessee look quite a bit different than this one. Yeah. My son lives in Cariville, Tennessee, right by the mountains there. I wonder if he's spotted This is uh, Madison County, where this 50 years with Big Clown took place. And he's in Campbell County. Okay, is that on the west side of Smokies? Uh, I think the east side. Oh, east side. I know some ladies around, live near Cherokee, South Carolina. They said there's some around there. A lot of people just, they're lucky they, you know, the big folks can live in the area and they don't, they need to ever encounter each other. That's, I, I deserve some luck after 20 years to see one sometime. I don't want to see one when I'm out in the woods. I'd like to see one when I'm in my car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want to come around the corner on the trail and bump into one. There's been a number of reports in Michigan where, oh, two or three at least, where people have, upon a sleeping Bigfoot. 
just be sleeping on the ground. And they, somebody gets close to them, they hear them, they jump up and run away. Now, there's the slow motion. Uh, there's two guys that have been working on the original copy of this film, trying to improve it as much as possible. They found out exactly what lens was in the, the camera and they're making adjustments for the focus. And so they said they may have a slightly better version. The original apparently has been lost. will never be found, but they've got a, this next, they got a copy that's a very good copy. Uh, there was some controversy about who owned it between two people and somebody had it you know, locked in a safe someplace. I don't know. It was, well, no one knows where it is right now. So. Yeah. Kind of a shame. The guy that took it died of cancer five or six years later. Okay. Now there's... Uh, there was an old hunter in Pennsylvania that was the first time I showed it to him, he said, well, you know, and this is different than most Bigfoot sightings, the thing would have just run into the woods and disappeared. And this guy said, well, the reason it's, it's letting itself be seen for so long is it's got some young ones hiding in the woods and it's trying to draw the, the human's attention away from it. So I don't know. And some people say that when they look in the background, they think they can see some one or two little ones. They're claiming this as a female. Yeah. yeah. What is the difference between a male and a female? Well, when, you see that, <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you see the close ups, it's, uh, it's, it's the same differences as among male and female yeah. humans. More so than the apes. Okay, what's next here? Yeah, that's a reflecting eye moving around the bushes, so that's not too good. Where did you find them? Well, I had one uh, section on here where the lady that, I wasn't there when the sound was recorded, she said there's three screams on this tape. When she played it for me, it turned out there were four, so maybe she wasn't fooling me. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the original tape with this white creatures at the house messing around. And it was very dark, so... Uh, my camera was in an upstairs bedroom in the house about 200 feet away. And I had it on telephoto, but it kept picking up the sounds of the people in the house. Um, where's my camera? The one up behind the bush. Yeah. Another incident happened at night. This was across the road from their front porch on a wooded hillside. There was, first there was grass, and there was some lot of brush, and then the woods. This is about a 10 foot tall bush or something. They saw these reflecting eyes for a while and then they shined the spotlight around and they picked up something shaking this bush. That went on for quite a while. Um, where is this at? This is in Newcomerstown, Ohio. Yeah, thanks for asking. Where I just, back in 1992. Now I think if I could get some good stills off of this, I might be able to, uh, to see if there's a, you know, black arm or a head or something back in there when you watch the video it's uh, well i used to have it on the analog tape if you ever use the analog oh, wow. <laughs> players when you would stop the tape the He's picture would always kind of shake and be fuzzy when you have it on digital I, if anybody knows how to work with digital tapes or digital discs and get some stills off this i'd really appreciate that i'm going to give you a copy of the whole thing so that goes on for a while let's see i lost my Eventually, the bush gets broken and thrown on the ground. Well, sure it is. Because mm -hmm. that's it. Don't like that spotlight. That's, that's mad. But the lady that did this, she made me take the audio off. She was swearing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's why there's no sound on this. At one point, she's telling her they were her 10-year-old son to go get the gun. Because her, uh, her husband had gone into town to buy stuff. She was alone with her. Well, the brother-in-law and her kids. Usually they were real hyper about the kids and guns, but she's telling her kids, go get the gun. Uh, let's see if I can fast forward. I got some more interesting stuff. I'll try to get to. Oh, 
oh yeah, there's a this area right near there. There was this little creek that was uh, was fed by a spring that came out of the ground about a half mile away. And I, th I think maybe that's one of the reasons they hung around. They'd been seen drinking out of that creek. There's one of those cement blocks like you see that gets thrown. They probably weighed at least weighs at least thirty pounds, maybe forty. There's a few tracks that we found. There would be no sense in trapping one. Oh, I don't know. I thought about that a lot. No, I think Has anybody ever did it? Uh, not that I heard of. Someone tried to make a trap out in Oregon, and then nothing ever came into it. Yeah, this was that more interesting part where there's something over there. Clean it now. Yeah, you can see that's the that's the window on the side of the building. It's something moving around back in there. This is this uh, truck tire here that weighs way over 100 pounds. That looks like it's one of things pretty. This building was uh, full of old cinder blocks and bicycle frames and junk all over the floor. So just to move around in there in the dark would be a little tricky. That looks like it's speed. I think I'm still on fast forward. Yeah, you are. Is he reacting to something? Can you see uh, the light on the camera or something like that? Come to visit the area before leaving uh, for home. We'll you'll see more of this later on. Probably. This is just a, I want to show you this for general background and maybe I'll backtrack. So the house would, would be like while you're standing here on the road, the house where the people live was behind you. And uh, these weeds out here were about four feet tall. It's important later on. When this thing walks across the field, this see the how it's not following these weeds. We have previous footage of activity. Uh, last night while we were at a meeting, some lasagna was taken from the opposite side of this house. It was set out of the trap at a high height on the ground. Uh, a few seconds, we'll see where this thing walks across the room. In the afternoon on Sunday, it was stuck in the wall, that's mighty too. This is a close-up of the house. You can see some of the damage that's been done. Yeah, that building, when I first started going down there, was in good shape. There weren't any of these holes in the wall and stuff like that. But uh, this area, you can see, when, once something runs into the brush there, it's out of sight. And those hills went way up. This there was what theirs was the last house on that little gravel road. It was a, a good mile to the next road. House where the road was. They knocked out the whole back wall of this house. Last night, it was leaning against this opened door end of the house. I don't. I went up in the attic. And, uh, had a whole lot of rocks thrown at me. Before lasagna and container and all that gone. And we were taken last night sometime between 8 p.m. and midnight. Unfortunately, no cameras were had to get us this in. This is what the area looks like. This is looking down the road in one direction. You can see the heavy. Well, okay, it's kind of getting the part I wanted you to see. Direction. Yes, this would watch this area over here. Road. And beyond the bushes and trees to the left is the home plan. Mm -hmm. The people live there and the closest to this are babies. Now, if this had been uh, a close up to the house, high quality film, it could be enlarged a lot more. The fact that it's video, I'm standing at the near edge of the road as I'm taking this. Mm -hmm. Something 
That's the area where I walked across. Right here. This is the house where my camera took the nighttime photos from my second story window. Shooting a good 200 feet towards the beginning. It's not fast forward. Now you'll notice, yeah, that's all right because there's nothing much here. Later on, you'll see there's some white creatures in there. This is the some of the rocks that were thrown up on the roof. Some of these rocks probably weighed seven or eight pounds. Between the house and the house of people there. It's not as fast as I'd like it to be. As you can see, it's absolutely behind. That's the area where the thing walked through the tall weeds. That post is about five feet tall. The weeds there are at least four feet or more. How did it not trample down the weeds? Like I didn't see any of the weed knocked down. It didn't walk through there. That's a good question. Well, that was this, that may have been taken beforehand. Let me go back. That's a good point. But the. Uh, the video may have, I don't know, I don't know what the time sequence was on that video. This, I don't think this is a fast. Okay, that's the regular scene. This is where we try to uh, enhance it a little bit. Yeah, should have taken the audio off of this. Maybe you can see this uh, Besides that black one, there's a second white over here. And the blues in the background. And there's another little white thing right there in the concept. Free big Awesome, yeah. We well, had just known that if it happened on that particular day, we could have gone back and documented it. I wanted to go back and go back and show you some more. Let's skip too far forward here. You can rewind it faster by clicking it several times. That's, yeah, it only, it only goes to about double speed. That's a little faster. Let's see two more times. There's two halves of the film, and one part you concentrate on what's on the left, but they want to just see more of what's in this area. There it is. Mm -hmm. And beyond the. We're going to see the two cars. When I watch this at home on my screen, I can stop it whenever I want it. Well, okay. maybe there's some more of this later. I think there may be more of this later on. Let's see what else we got. Got a little index if you go down to this. Just say in general, keep your eyes open and uh, watch for uh, usual things around your house. Broken branches, missing pet food. Quite a few people report Something banging on the side of their house. <coughs> Did they ever go up to, on the decks or got really close? Or? Yeah, I think they like to watch TV if they can stand back in the woods and see a TV set through something. <coughs> uh, Sometimes they'll do nasty things to pets. I know a guy over in Van Buren County, they kept about an 80 pound dog outside in the dog house. And one time in the winter, he saw this Bigfoot walking off with a dog under one, one arm. I guess he heard it barking and squealing. And he said this, the hips were about this wide and the waistline was about this high. And he 
yelled at the thing and dropped the dog. Yeah. They also seem to like to mess around with ponies and horses. Uh, what do you think about Lisa Shields' uh, mane braiding of her horses? It's kind of like, like when you're on it. Well, she's not the only one that's reported that. One of these photos shows us some mane braiding. I'm going to look at them. I've worked with computers all my life. I've never learned why, when you have to click once and when you have to click twice. Nobody's ever told me. Once is for yes and twice is for no. It's loading it. Usually when there's something like that, you have to double click. To load it. And this one, the enter button doesn't do much. It's the left mouse button. Left yep. button and left the mouse button. I've got an apple at home. You just so. click it twice very quickly and Ah, there we go. We talked about branch formations. I found this last uh, winter over in Washtenaw County, somewhere north of Ann Arbor. There's, uh, all these branches are stacked up against this tree trunk. There were other trees of the same size in the area, and none of them had this kind of branches stacked around there. Uh, it's, it's another view of it. Oh, the interesting thing, we're hiking down this trail in the winter, and I see what looked like large tracks coming down the slope. And they look, kind of looked like possible Bigfoot tracks, because they were big and far apart, no heel drag, couldn't see the toes. So we followed them up the hill about 50 or 60 yards, and we find this branch configuration. Slide. I guess I had a blank in there. That's just another view down on the ground. It looked like a little bit more than should be there naturally. But the other, and well, another thing I've noticed lately, often when we find these branch configurations, there'll be one sapling off to the side that's bent over in an arch and stuck in the middle of the other branches. Seems to be part of the pattern I've seen in different parts of the state. The same one there. Okay, that's not the same. Well, the interesting part about that area up there is about 30 feet off to the right. We followed these tracks, and they ended. It was like a giant comma in the eight or ten inches of snow. The snow was pretty deep, and there was no tracks coming into this area. So I think. The thing had walked in there at night and laid down and slept on the ground and snowed all around it. And then it got up and walked downhill in the morning. So there were no tracks coming into the bedding area, just tracks going up. That was one of my more interesting finds. These are just pictures I found on the internet. That's a very iffy picture there. That one looks like somebody were to be wearing a costume. Another one that's floating around on the oh, internet. Exactly. Yeah. Could be the rear end of a bear. Yeah. This is the. Uh, <coughs> who's the guy that does this? Todd Standing. Yeah, Todd Standing, some guy in Canada. Uh, I read an analysis of this by some people that make Hollywood costume things, and they said they thought it was a fake. Uh, whatever it is, it's very detailed. Somebody went through a lot of trouble to put all that hair and stuff. But see, it's got this human type lip, nose, mouth kind of thing. Who knows? That's the same object, whatever it is. It looks exactly the same. Uh, that's something very vague back in there that a friend of mine picked up on one of his photos. This is the kind of stuff you get on the internet if you look and look. Like, this is one of this is part of the video. This is one of the better ones that's out there. Shows the head being kind of forward on the body. It's got kind of shiny fur. When you uh, costume things, often the fur looks very ragged and uh, dull. And live animals seem to often there's a, there's some oil in their fur or something makes it a little shinier. Has anybody ever come across a dead one? Uh, just the only report I heard was these two girls many years ago found this corpse in the snow, and they didn't think too much of it, or nobody believed. Nobody ever went back to check on it. And in this 50 Years of Bigfoot book, this lady says when she was a young girl, she used to climb the, the trees on the property, she saw the Bigfoots burying an infant. She said it was an infant that died, and they, a number of them got together, and they had sharp sticks, they dug a big hole, and put the baby in there, and pulled it back up and stomped on it. 
but no one's ever you know, dug it up. So. And this is an interesting one. This came from uh, France. Somebody supposedly brought this creature into France and exhibited it for a short while. Then they thought they were going to get in trouble with the authorities and it disappeared. But the, the hand doesn't look uh, very human-like. Uh, I was just thinking that the other day. The distance from the knuckle to the here seems quite the same distance seems pretty big. It looks kind of scary, so I don't know what that is. That's another, that, well, that one could be real. I don't know, it's a big, bulky something or other that somebody put a costume on, they had a lot of padding. That's all they got out of it. That's another early part of the Patterson film that's not seen very often. I was kind of wondering if this was a separate creature that looked a little different. This was from Fort Worth, Texas many years ago, just this big white blob. It kind of looks like a year up in there. Oh, the Lake Worth monster. That's not a very good one either. Well, this down here is a little bit better. Are they always in a dark color? Uh, there's been reports of white ones. The area where I went, well, that one in that house in that little building was uh, apparently was white. And they said there was a very large white one. Ohio seems to have more white ones than uh, other places. Uh, sometimes they're kind of light brown, buff colored. Very often there it's reddish brown or dark, dark brown to black. Reddish tones are pretty popular. So there's something back in the woods. Here again, if somebody would go back, you know, an hour later and have a human stand right there and take the same picture, it'd be a lot more interesting. You don't even know it was a shadow. Well, this this isn't a shadow. It could be somebody in a costume. It's, uh, it's very upright. It's got big hips. Yeah, that's that looks almost like claws. That could be a, an upright bear. That's possible. This came from uh, guys, people here from Ontario. I never did find out what part of Ontario it was. Brantford, southern Ontario, just outside of Hamilton. Oh, okay. Well, you don't have to go probably too far. In I don't know how far north you have to do to go to get out of the farming areas, but uh, go to a fur north. Yeah, an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, we were up in my wife and I were in Alg Alg Algonquin Park two oh, years yeah. ago, yeah. and there was a picture on the internet that was somebody was driving along with a GoPro camera, taking stills as they went, and they got a pretty good shot of a Bigfoot alongside the road, oh, yeah. standing maybe 40, 50 foot. But it's better, it's at least as good as this. This is also from. A website, I think it's called Sasquatch Ontario. I don't know if it's real or not. Is that Mike Patterson? That's that the one that's got all the audio? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. This one is the same thing. This Ontario is Ontario or Sasquatch. Apparently, I don't know, this is a tree branch in this area. I think it's behind there. So. <clears throat> We're still waiting for a really good one. That's that Adrian Erickson from northern Kentucky. Got kind of a button nose there. Kind of they think this was a young female. This was. <laughs> somebody told me this was a fake. I mean, I don't know. Well, that's the guy. My friend Bob sent that picture to me. Yeah. That guy. The guy there is a. Uh, he collects arrowheads. And that's taken down in southwestern Missouri, okay. and he's got it. He's got. He, he had a camera to take a picture of himself, showing his one hand has arrowheads in it, and his other hand I think he's got a shovel. Yeah. But that he didn't even notice that until about three or four months later. That <laughs> object's up there. Well, he's he's the got pretty long arms. It's about nine foot tall. Yeah. And when he went back, it wasn't there. So. Unless somebody was a stump and somebody moved it. Could be the real thing. Well, that's another. Oh, this is the one that somebody said was a fake. I was I got mixed up between the two. Who knows? That's the one from Field and Stream again. <coughs> Here's some other. Does that look like that was from a distance? That could be. This one, if you ever hear a dog man, this one seems to have a long snout, it's a baboon type thing. 
Yeah, I've seen that as a possible dog man. Yeah. yeah and there's a couple of shadowy things. This one, I don't know where it came from, but it, they blocked out the face. I don't know, it's got a rope around its neck. Hmm. This part looks like you can see some of the bones in the chest. I don't know, no idea what that is. Hmm. Somebody just drew that. That's probably about typical size. If you bump into a Bigfoot, that's probably about how big it would be. Hmm. That's that Hillsdale County, Michigan track. <clears throat> Tom and I have been out to this location and seen this pony, and uh, we don't know how the braids got in the pony's hair, but the, the owner of the pony thinks the Bigfoot's like to fool around with it. It doesn't like to stay in a stall. They keep it outdoors on about a 100, 150 foot long rope. And they'll come out in the morning sometimes, and parts of the rope will be 10 feet up in the little tree branches and stuff. And they... <coughs> They claim there's a number of Bigfoots on their property. I've seen tracks and had a couple incidents. Uh, I believe there are Bigfoots that come around there at least occasionally. That's my photo from up north. Now, this is real interesting. This is in Van Buren County, and I can't give out any names or exact locations, but I've done a lot of work there with game trackers and stuff. And this there's a, some kind of a fence, like cyclone fence. This is probably a corral. They have burros and ponies and turkeys and uh, peacocks on this property. Anyway, you can see this dark figure here, and in the next photo, it's on this side. It's a little different. I've been to this spot. <laughs> this is where the owner said he saw the one pick his dog up and walk off with it. A whole lot of reports in that one. Here. This, I think, is from Russia. When you blow it up, it doesn't look real good. But looks like it's some kind of long arm. Russia or Siberia. That's that's uh, that's that one I showed before from Ray Wallace. Nope. Oh, <laughs> oh no, I, I'm sorry. I, think I read some report about some the natives had a legend or something. You wouldn't expect them to be in Hawaii. But they are, uh, some of the, you know, Vancouver is a very large island off of British Columbia, Canada. And there's some other, yeah, there's a lot of them on Vancouver Island. It's about the size of the Lower Peninsula. And there's some other offshore islands that they think, you know, they're not real close to the mainland. And they think there's some other out on those islands. Too. So a lot in Oregon? Oh, yeah, a whole lot. Because I was up in the spring. Oh, okay. I can understand where they does awesome. the yeah. channel freeze over? Can they just walk over on ice? I don't. Uh, I don't yeah. think that that or the ocean freezes that much. That's not that far. You know, Seattle yeah. climate is relatively mild in the winter. Oh, Seattle, yeah. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. Further north, as you get in the Alaska yeah, Panhandle, there's a whole lot of big fucking ports from the Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> they say they can swim home. Yeah, yeah. yeah they said they're really great swimmers. Yeah. yeah. yeah now the this area. one looks. I don't know what in the world this is, but the arms look awfully short. Everybody says Bigfoots have really long arms. Yeah, but if his shoulders are lower. That's right. Yeah, maybe the arms really start about here. It's interesting. Well, it looks like an old, old photo. What's the story behind that one? Do you know? I don't know. It's from 1890 or something like that. So, you know. Uh, we could do a on that. Ah, this is this uh, Van Buren County area. Here's the, with the game tracker photo. Here it's all dark, and see there's some reflecting eyes back here. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a little interesting. Red bugs. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's that similar area, same same location. Uh, and this one, there's some reddish things. If you look real close, kind of looks like a face and a brow ridge. Two of them. And here it's not. In this photo, it's not there. So I don't know. Not real great, but it's. Part of my role with some of this is you don't know what's anything is for sure, but if I see something interesting, I'll, I'll drive out there and check it out. If I don't see anything interesting, I don't go back. This is my game camera on this property in Van Buren County. I didn't notice this until after I 
taken me six months after I took these photos and I started looking at different ones. This was taken at uh, 12.51 a.m. and this one's 11.48 p.m. So this one was taken first, this one later. But the comparison is, here you can see the two garbage cans real plain. And here there's a huge black object blocking out one entire garbage can. Also, on this one, the people had their the houses just off to the left. They had their yard light on from the house, or they shining near the house, and they turned it off. And then the camera took this picture with different lighting conditions. But uh, still, I think there's something blocking out. These garbage cans have animal feed in them, and the owner says he, a lot of times, a third or a half of the feed is missing, and there's none on the ground. And is the top replaced? I think so, yeah. I think, they, I think they're, they're usually when they break into people's freezers, the tops don't get replaced. I'm not too sure about this picture. The guy took this from a distance and he says, well, there's a giant Bigfoot back here. This is like six foot high corn or five feet high corn. But uh, on the one hand, it looks like it moved. But if you look carefully at all the background, like <laughs> things lined up, he moved it. The camera, the guy taking the picture moved quite a bit between these two pictures and the one in the bottom. But, uh, well, it's not exactly the same. So maybe this thing actually moved, I don't know. But it actually moved and it's something very, very big. This is a blow up of a picture that was taken from a long way off. There's some more of the Patterson stuff. This is another game tracker photo from Pennsylvania. Uh, something was taken fruit off this guy's fruit trees. This game tracker picked this thing up. It could be a, a Bigfoot that's bending over. This would be its head. And that's its arm. But it's supposed to be it's holding a baby, too. Well, yeah, see the right there? When you blow it up, that looks like the... Uh, well, yeah, this could be the baby's arm. Mm -hmm. and, uh, kind of looks like a little paw. That's supposed to be the head there on the mouth. And that's its back. Yeah, that's it's the back. The one, yep. That's the head. It mange. Yeah, it's <laughs> got I got hit by someone or something. So that's, that, that could be the real thing. It's mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a mistake. Yeah, that's just some more stuff. Let her show much. Now, Tom and Eric and I camped out in. Uh, <clears throat> I think it was Washtenaw County uh, State Recreation Area a year ago, September. And Tom had his game tracker camera mounted on the back of his small motorhome. There was, was there a picnic table near here that had, had some Right in front of the tent, you can't see it. Yeah. Yeah. Below the bike. frame. We had this, we've got several pictures taken from the same camera in the same position. And uh, see, there's two little eyes right there. Tom's got another picture with some bigger eyes right this area, which you know, I show. But the interesting part is between these two pictures, if you look over here, there's this little tent. And when you look over there, there's something extra. One frame. And when you blow it up, it looks like this. So, I don't know, this looks like a board. Maybe. And this part, like when I look at it on my computer, maybe a little better, it looks to me like there's a head, maybe an eye. This looks like a forearm and a hand. I wasn't sure if that's the bumper or the camper sticking there, or well, a reflection off the side of the camper could be. But the camera, the camera didn't move. You, know, you see the tent looks pretty much the same. Yeah, there's a hundred pictures like that, but only one has that in it. Yeah, only one has this object in this area. And there's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich sitting on the little table that's just to the left of that. I was, uh, I, I slept about 15 feet from there in the corner of the camper. Well, I was sleeping in the tent. That's my tent. <laughs> so you never know. Once in a while, you, you do this stuff. You know, it's, I do it partly because I like to hike in the woods and, and tell stories with the guys. But interesting stuff happens once in a while. I took a piece of trim screw out. That's the same thing. That's the better. I think that's the last one. Yeah, I just want to mention my website one more time. It's michiganbigfoot.org if you want to contact me. That's the easiest way to do it. Yeah, thanks for uh, all your attention. Any other questions or anything? Thank you. Okay, keep your eyes open.
I uh, find out any Bigfoot conference, anybody that put their email on there, I'll send you a notice. Maybe we'll see you all again sometime. Thanks for your help. Yeah. 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 Yeah.